Um, the last month we started a series that we're going to try, try to emphasize this year on the character of God, trying to understand who God is. And the things that we're going to be focusing on in this series of studies is the ways that we are made in God's image, the ways that we are similar to God and our nature reflects the nature of God or the character of God. Last month we talked about the fact that God is knowable, that he is not some indefinable, ununderstandable being or entity. Even though he is beyond us, he is greater than us, he transcends us, and there are certain aspects of his being that we cannot adequately comprehend because we have no ability to experience what it is to have no beginning. We have no ability to experience what it is to be ever present. But there are other aspects of God's character that we do experience in ourselves, things with which we can identify. And those are the things that we're going to try to talk about, Lord willing, this year. That's why I asked Brother Brady to read this passage from 1 John chapter 4. Because it is my firm belief that the fundamental characteristic of God's nature is love. Two different times in this short passage from 1 John 4, it simply says, God is love. That is not all that God is. God is also those other characteristics that we're going to talk about and even those that we're not going to, to talk about. But this is one of the very few characteristics where it is God is love. It nowhere says that God is only this or only that. It says that God is faithful. It says that God is merciful. But here it doesn't say God is loving. It's not an adjective. It's a noun. God is love. Fundamental characteristic of his being. And wonderfully, it's something with which we can identify. We all have a fundamental need for love. We all have a fundamental desire. And we spend time and energy seeking love. And we spend time and energy trying to give love. All of this is a reflection of God's nature stamped on our own hearts. It is part of the proof that we are in fact made in His image. And so I want us to think about this this morning and I want us to think about it in terms of helping us understand who God is. Helping us understand some of the ways that God is motivated, why he does what he does, why he chooses what he chooses. I think love is a wonderful key to answering a lot of those questions. Why did God do this? Why did God choose that? Love is almost always, if not always, part of that answer. But to understand it, I want us to look at a few different things. First of all, I want us to look at the overall picture that is used in Scripture to explain God's love. And the picture that God chooses to explain how He loves, to help us understand His love, is that of a parent, that of a father. That's what God is. He is a father. And we are His children. If you back up a chapter... So 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, it says, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called children of God. And such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. John 5, verse 18, it says that the Jews were trying to kill Jesus. Because he called God his own father and made himself equal with God. 
In the four Gospels of the New Testament, Jesus refers to God as his Father 150 times or more. Or the New Testament writer, but usually in Jesus' words, refer to God as the Father of Jesus. That was controversial. It made people want to kill Jesus. It was not a new idea. The Old Testament also talked about God as a father, and God called himself a father in the Old Testament, but not in the same terms that Jesus did. And it's true that Jesus was and is claiming divinity, and in that sense, an equality with God the Father. But for example, in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8, it says, But now, o Lord, you are our father, we are the clay. And you are our potter. All of us are the work of your hand. It's a very interesting thing to put the idea of a father with his children or a father with his child and a potter with his clay in the same verse. The same explanation about God. The announcement was made today about the last to leaders uh, Bible Bowl test. They've already taken one practice test. They're going to take another practice test. And we have been studying at my house. And over the last week, my wife has made me participate in the preparation. And basically, what I have to do is sit at a computer with a PowerPoint that's been prepared extremely well by somebody else. And just hit a button and it brings up a question with four multiple choice answers. And I read the question and read the four possible answers, and then one of my two daughters tells me what they think the answer is, and I hit another button, and it tells us whether they're right or not. And when I heard that they were going to do Proverbs, I thought, oh, brother. That's way too deep for a 10-year-old, much less a 6-year-old. But I've been answering questions over the last few days like this. Daddy? What is a steadfast heart? Daddy, what is strife? <clears throat> it gives me the opportunity to mold my children. It gives me the opportunity to write on their heart from the Word of God. Like a potter molding the clay. That's the picture that is not only painted of parents in the world, but it's a picture of how God explains himself to us. He wants to do the same thing with us. One of the most powerful teachings about the fatherhood of God is the prodigal son in Luke 15 is where that's recorded. And it's a beautiful parable. And if you think about it, it shows parenting and parenthood in remarkably, I mean, uh, it's just like parenting children today. It was written 2,000 years ago, but kids are still doing today exactly what the prodigal son did then, literally. If people are still doing today spiritually what people were doing to God then spiritually. But this young man grows up the son of a wealthy father. And he says to his father, give me my share, I'm ready to go. And the father does it. The father is kind and generous. And he allows the son to leave. And the son leaves and blows it off. And doesn't just blow it all, but gets mired in the deepest and worst sin he can find. And becomes completely destitute, about to kill himself by his own choices. And he comes to his senses. And he says, you know what? I'd rather be a servant in my father's house than live in this pig pen. And he gets up and he journeys back home. And his plan is to tell his father, just let me work for just give me a place to stay and something to do and feed me. Luke 15, verse 20. 
So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. A parent doesn't stop loving a child. The child may leave. The child may disappoint the parent. The child may become mired in the worst life he can find. But the father still loves. That's the love of God. We always call this parable the prodigal son. What if we named it after the father? Instead of naming it after the son, what if we named it after the father? What name would we put on it? The patient father. The forgiving father, the waiting father, the loving father. Love gets it all. Love explains it all. It explains every choice of the father all the way through. And when the child comes back, he embraces it. That's what God wants you to know about himself. That's what God wants you to understand about who God is. He is a father. But we're a little bit different than the prodigal son. We're not born into his house by luck of the draw. We're not born into his house through <coughs> physical means by which people are physically born. <coughs> We're adopted. Amen. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 and 5 says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. Notice this. In love, he predestined pre-selected, pre-chose us to be his adopted children. In most cases, when there is not a prior relationship, what motivates adoption? A desire to have a child to love. You don't know who the child is. You don't know where the child is going to come from. I've had family members, and I'm sure many of you have too, who have gotten on a plane and flown across the world to get a child who looks nothing like them so that they can have a child to love. And people who adopt usually don't get that child until he's several months old. And they understand that that child may have some lingering effects from the difficulty of being born without loving parents. And they realize that as that child grows, they're going to have to deal with some difficulties because of the situation into which that child was born. But do they not do it? They do it. They do it gladly. They do it willingly because they love that's what God did. That's what God does. That's who God is. God is love. And that's how he explains it to us. That's how he says, understand who I am. I'm a parent who chose to adopt you, knowing that you were imperfect, knowing I was going to have some heartbreak. But I love you, and I want you anyway. And when you come back, he runs and embraces you. He also disciplines us. Why does the prodigal son go to a foreign country? Because he knows it's going to be a lot harder to live like he wants to live if he stays around his father. The two are incompatible. He can't do it. He's got to go. 
God wants to mold us. He wants to shape us because he's our father. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 says, For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Here, I think, is one of the big mental hurdles that we struggle with. We don't like to see ourselves as children. We like to see ourselves as mature, as strong, as self-sufficient, as smart, as able to take care of ourselves. We don't like to see ourselves as in need of somebody helping us change and grow and learn and improve. When you're in school, they tell you that all the time. You're learning, you're supposed to grow, you're supposed to get better and better at this, and you are have the mindset of a person who's supposed to be maturing. But once you mature and you're fully grown and you're on your own and you're paying your own bills, then you like to think, all right, I'm there, I'm done, I'm finished. God teaches us that we can't look at him that way. Because we never catch up to Him. We never equal our Heavenly Father. We never reach His level of wisdom. We never plateau at a level of maturity where we have no more climbing to do. And so He continually teaches and molds and shapes and works on us. We have to embrace that. We have to see that as a good thing. Because when we start to think we don't need it, we become rebellious. We become resistant. But God's plan as a father is for love and discipline. Go back to 1 John chapter 4. Look at verses 9 and 10. The one who says he is in the light. You made up the wrong chapter. Verse 9. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. God pictures His love with the image of a father and child or a parent and child. God proves His love through the sacrifice of Jesus. Jesus is the proof of the depth of God's love. Jesus is the proof of the reality of God's love. Jesus is the answer to every question about how much does God love you. And this is love. Not that we love God but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Sent his son to satisfy the requirements of justice. Sent his son to pay our spiritual debt. Sent his son to take our punishment. That's love. It's undeniable. It's inescapable. All of God's decisions have helping people in mind. And you can go back and you can look at the most criticized instructions in the Old Testament where peoples were wiped out and where instructions were given or criticism were given when the failure to carry those instructions out existed. It's always to protect God's people. It's always to insulate God's people. It's always to further the interests of the people who are seeking to have God as their father and as their leader. It's the same way with you. 
the difficult things that he asks of you, the things that he allows you to go through, which are difficult and unpleasant. He always sees the end, and he always has the end in mind. And he has proven it by the sacrifice that he has made for you. And any sacrifice that he asks from you will be far less than what he's made for you. Romans 5 verse 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He did it before he asked us to do anything. He did it before he asked us to change anything. He did it before he asked us to sacrifice anything. He completed it first. John 3.16 tells us why he did it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Well, proof of God's love, it is the sacrifice of Jesus. And that makes God's love trustworthy. That means you can trust God's love all the time, every time. Jeremiah 31, verse 3. The Lord appeared to him from afar, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. That's how God's love is. We don't, we don't, we can't picture, we have no real experience with eternity. We can't remember what it's like to have no beginning and to have no end because everything we experience here has an end. But God's love doesn't. God's love is everlasting. The way God is eternal. It never runs out. It never changes. It's always there. Romans 8 tells us that it's unconquerable. Romans 8 verse 37. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither life, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The love of God cannot be conquered. The love of God cannot be overthrown. It can be rejected. It can be walked away from. You can leave the benefits of the love of God and go into a foreign country and ruin yourself in riotous living. But you will never conquer the love of God. And nothing outside yourself will ever conquer the love of God. No matter how big it is, no matter how scary it is, no matter how strong it is, nothing conquers the love of God. You can trust it. You can trust it every day, all the time, in every situation. That's who God is. God is love. Go back to 1 John chapter 4. He explains that to us. By then, verse 17, verse 16, we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. Believe the love. Think about that. Believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love. For perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears 
is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. Now I know that part about fear bothers some of them. I know that some people are afraid that God hasn't forgiven them. That God hasn't taken away their guilt. Some people are afraid, what if I, I, what if I don't go to heaven? What if I'm not saved? For some people, that may be a valid fear, but it shouldn't be a valid fear for long, because you can address it. If you have addressed it, but you still feel that fear, focus on the love of God, and think about how God has explained himself through love, and think, think about the lengths to which God has gone to prove his love and to show you that his love is trustworthy. And set yourself with the goal to overcome fear because perfect love casts out fear. But if you're still in that part of God, if you're still living the way you want to and rejecting the discipline of the Father, Rejecting the instructions and the leadership of your father. That you got reason to fear. You got reason to worry. But you can get rid of that worry right now. You can have that fear taken away right now. <clears throat> but you got to come back. You got to embrace your father. You got to embrace his ways. You got to embrace his manner of living. And you've got to live in his house under his authority. If you need to come to your father, the only path is to come through Christ, the one who made the sacrifice to take away your sins. Come to Christ today. Put your faith in Jesus. Confess your faith. Repent of your sins. Be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sin. If you need to come to Christ, if you need to return to Christ, Please come down front as we stand and sing.